of, a, of abandoning what I had written and uh, try and try and exchange a few views with you um, uh, in the light of what we've been hearing. Um, think of it. I think of uh, these uh, agriculture industry dichotomy uh, and the problem of changing by changing the direction from the one to the other. It's a rather artificial process. Anybody who comes to planning comes to a given country with a given program. And therefore, the question is not so much changing from one to the other, but finding within the Uh, within the, the path on which you already embarked, those elements which have the most uh, uh, power to <coughs> advance where you are going or the least deterrent to where you are going, but not to try and jump from one to an entirely different model. I'm saying this because there have been jumps in policy uh, that are unrealistic because the experience of people is also based on what they've been doing before, what they've been aspiring to before, and so on and so forth. And when you want to make change, you must first of all measure what change is feasible, not just what change is theoretically optimal, but what change is feasible. Uh, I want to say that uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, launched China on this obstacle, this race, that he seems to have discovered what people needed instead of what the theoretician thought was optimal. And that seems to me accounts for the, the speed and success of his experiment. Uh, and it is also an argument for liberalizing, because you can't sit in a crowd or Beijing and imagine what people need. There's, there's a certain argument for democracy in that, in the process. Uh, Ghana started out with many advantages that was 20 years before uh, Deng Xiaoping launched China also on a modified communist system. Ghana had been practicing a modified communist system. And after so many years, with so many advantages, you, you'll be surprised to know that at that time, we had reserves equal to that of an Arab prince. We, we had accumulated so much money. And we are not bothered with winter. We are not, there's so many advantages. And what did we spend doing, our time doing? We spent our time for 40 years and more, 50 years, following things that are important, things that are interesting, but nevertheless, things that are not focused on development. I think this uh, analysis uh, must start with that, that the government 
of the country must be in tune with the aspirations, the real aspirations of people, and must shine a bright light on the uh, attainment of those uh, aspirations. Because you can spend your time talking politics, doing this, that, and the time that you spend on those things, you don't have to spend on the other, on the other development aspects. So the distribution of your political time between development and other things. I, I put all the other things together, but they may not belong together. That, that, that uh, ag aggregated over 40 years. If there's a gap in your development rate of 5%, can you imagine what it amounts to after 40 years? Any theoretical choice of model that you could have made would never equal the choice in your condition after 50 years if you have not been spending enough of your time on development. The, uh, and so today we should be asking how can Ghana catch up with the rapidly uh, growing rate of wealth of the Chinese? Not just, not uh, what what can what what uh, can uh, 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 how how do, how does Ghana compare with its neighbors in Africa? Because we did not start on the same footing. We did not. And the thing that uh, makes the difference, seems to me, is the, in the Chinese case, the single-minded concentration on development. Uh, and this, in spite of mistakes, if, if you're going to make mistakes and we're all talking as if um, our, our equations mean are true. But there's nothing to show that they are true. It's only history that will show whether they are true or not. But what we cannot uh, ignore is that if we steadily concentrate on growing wealth, then after 50 years, we'll be there. We'll, we may not be as wealthy as some people, but we would have got rid of the most degrading aspects of poverty. Uh, the, the uh, um, next thing I would like to suggest, it may not be very much, uh, uh, very much uh, welcome uh, in a group of economists, but you'll forgive me. Uh, uh, you, you want a strategy of development which is stable. This is one uh, factor of change that I think we have to guard against. Changing, switching from one to the other. From the, We've had so many uh, different models in Ghana. But if we started right by being democratic, by uh, observing our natural endowments as they are, rather than as we would like them to be, and if we then maintain policy, maintain stability in policy, then I think we don't have much to, to fear.
fear for the future. We go on chopping and changing, then we have a lot to account for our own poverty. This uh, stability seems to have uh, achieved in China by the um, the, the, the residual of state control that then shall be left in the system while, uh, while liberalizing. I, I, I think that it's a futile uh, dichotomy, controlled economy, uh, liberal economy. I think that in every society that you will have a mixture, a mixture according to the nature of the enterprise you are engaged in. And so when I see um, these models draw a conclusion in favor of big enterprise, small enterprise, in favor of uh, urbanization, favor of rural sectors. I, I immediately know that we're barking up the wrong tree. Because what is life? What, what does a man use in ordinary life? From morning when you got up until now, what things have you made use of? They are the products of various industries various agricultural activities, various services, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me always a factor of some danger, so, so at least warn, to, be able to warn ourselves against it, that we got focused on this is the era of industrialization. I will go pell-mell for industrialization. And we find ourselves a lot, a lot short on, on the other things that we need. Uh, it seems to me, however, that a few things we might say for the industry is that we seem to have the industry playing the role of a, a catching disease. A catching disease is different from other diseases in the sense that when you have, you have it, your neighbor can catch it from you. Whereas if you have a fracture, that's, that's yours. But if you have a catching disease, your neighbor can catch it from you. And it seems to me that uh, industrial enterprises has more of a momentum built into it than agriculture. But in agriculture also, it is because we have not tried hard enough. As they say, if we follow uh, the history of this country, the Portuguese were here 500 years ago, introducing us to the seaborne trade of Europe. But it didn't, we did not go further. Why? It's not because what we had to produce. The structure of production was not very different from that of Europe. Food and things like that. Industry was not developed. But they followed within that structure lines of development that brought them into a situation where they got a bigger proportion of economic activity that was of the nature of a catching industry rather than a static industry. I have watched the progress here and I would like to uh, just use a few examples 
to illustrate my general point. Everybody here espouses a theory where we need uh, a variety of means of transport so that each class of goods can move according to their own nature and so on. But we have spent the last 40 years or so producing in Ghana a, a uni a uni mode uh, uh, society. We've, we've closed down the railways. We, we've we've uh, reduced the uh, 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 what do you call it airline industry and so on. And we are now left with the roads. So now everybody complains about the roads. But it's because nobody's been watching. We've got a pipeline from a car from the refinery going to Tema on the lake and producing a distribution point up in the north, which would have served uh, a lot of the north and saved the road from Accra to Kumasi. We've left that piece of uh, iron mongery in the, in the ground to rot. And we keep on complaining about uh, what uh, uh, about the, 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 the carnage on our roads and so on. It is because we have not followed through. There are too many unfinished projects in Ghana. And so, if we if we might use the economists, we have a lot of capital that is not producing any result for you'd be surprised how much of, the, of, the, of this there is in the country. We have, uh, for instance, uh, said that the cocoa industry, cocoa is our biggest product, and so on. But after all these years, why did the product progress in the cocoa sector why did it stop at the farm gate? Why didn't it go further? After years and years, everybody was talking about how we are going to process cocoa. Even today, you ask the, the University of Ghana how many of their graduates are working in cocoa, or how many patents we've got in the cocoa industry. We have produced a half success growing cocoa, and then we've turned over to the other things. And we, we have a, a very good salt industry. And 40 years ago, I, I was a consultant to one of our industrialists and going to advise him on setting up a caustic soda plant. That's 40 years ago. We never did. We keep on talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. And finally, finally another example that I must bring to your attention. We are a new oil exporting country. And this is a prospect that is generating excitement all over. But we are all focused on how to divvy up the money that will come. For instance, we haven't thought of the requirements of port capacity and so on for the industry. It's a small industry, but it will grow. So in 40 years' time, we'll soon find ourselves that we've divided up the money, gone into education, gone into this, that, but we haven't left anything for the needs of the industry. So that we are stymied. And we, we have 
too many of those success stories. It doesn't matter. You can't eat petroleum. But if you develop it well, you can't exchange. Because that's the point of the, of the of the development. And yet we have a, a psychology that stops short at the immediate benefits, but does not go through to the end of the story, or doesn't go long enough. And I would like, uh, finally, to say something about uh, the planning industry. We, we have all adopted planning as a method of achieving economic growth. So it is no use uh, 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 ignoring, ignoring that factor. But the powerful, the, the uh, role that the, the state in planning must necessarily involve the state is, is that we do not pay attention to the essentials of planning, but we include too many things. The planning must be powerful, must be equipped to take a strategic view, and it must have the assistance to finance a plan. Those are the essentials. But we go on planning all the other things that are peripheral, if, 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 if so, but sometimes quite unrelated to where we, we have been going from. And we go along and we do not maintain our strategy. If we had maintained our strategy by now, we could have three or four industries that are world class, but we did not maintain strategy. And it doesn't matter whether those would have been in being a leading chocolate producer or being a leading oil exporter. We would have, we would have gone very far, but we have not gone very far with anything because we have too many uncompleted, too many uh, diversions, too many preoccupations. We must have a practice, we must have uh, uh, developed our practice of planning in a way that will give us the optimum results, and that is maintaining strategy, pushing it to its logical conclusion, and then we'll be all right.